features found on Hogslat's free access stall make it simply the best you can buy for your operation. The stalls are manufactured from galvanized 12 gauge tube and 5 8 inch rod with stainless steel assembly hardware. Adjustable stainless steel feet insert into stainless steel legs and pivot to a slat opening. The gate mechanism consists of large stainless steel pivot points allowing for trouble free activation without weights or springs. To learn more about our free access stalls, go to our website at www.hogslat.com. All right, our uh, final speaker for the, this afternoon's session is Dr. Daniel Linares. Uh, Daniel is an associate professor and director of graduate education in the Department of Veterinary Diagnostics uh, and Production Animal Medicine, VDPAM, in the College of Veterinary Medicine at Iowa State University. He focuses on field epidemiology and works towards uh, development and evaluation of strategies to improve the health and productivity of swine populations. So with that, let's go ahead and welcome Dr. Linares. Thanks, Matt, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, and thanks to the organizing committee, the IPIC uh, le uh, leadership to, for putting this program together and for the opportunity for us here to share a little bit about what our group is working on. And we're gonna switch a little bit of uh, gears, talk a lot about the good stuff on all the way from colostrum to guilt. And now we're gonna go back a little bit and talk more about health. So a little bit about our, our group. This is uh, who, who we are and what we do. Really proud of our group. We are 11 uh, researchers focused on field epidemiology, more specifically uh, towards development ev evaluation of strategies to, uh, uh, to evaluate strategies to improve swine health and productivity under field conditions. So uh, that's who we are and what we do. And today we're gonna talk about this pro uh, this program who is uh, Giovanni, I, I don't think my computer here is reflecting what's on the screen. It's almost like this is connected with a different okay. computer. Thanks, Colin. All right, so so I, I, I was just saying that this program that we're gonna talk here about is is um, led by Giovanni Trevisan, who is this gentleman here uh, with the macroepidemiology and the SDRS letters um, uh, uh, under his name. And so the program that we're gonna talk about is called POMP, which, short for, which is short for PERS Outbreak Management Program. And what this program consists of, it's a pretty much a benchmarking program where we capture data on how farms, breeding herds uh, that broke with PERS virus, how, how are they dealing with the infection? So we're, we capture a bit about their demographics, herd size, GDU, what they do with their, uh, with their guilds, and then a little bit about uh, a herd uh, bio, bio management uh, for for PERS, right? Do they close their herds? Do they not? Do they vaccinate? Do they not? Do they do live virus inoculation? What else do, do, do they do? And then we track those herds over time, uh, associating those um, survey uh, type, type of data with metrics such as how long did it take for the farm to reach back to producing negative pigs uh, at winning, what was the productivity impact, and how long did it take for that farm to reach back the level of productivity that it had prior to the break. And the last aspect of the project is we're doing some whole genome sequencing of PERS virus, right? So a little bit uh, uh, beyond just the R5 sequencing, we go to the whole virus and and sequence the whole thing, and then again look back and see how how much the of the variability in time to stability, time to baseline productivity, 
uh, uh, is explained by viral properties. So I'm going to share some of those results here. Uh, this slide is, is kind of busy, don't uh, expect you to, to read that. Just want to say here that there is still a lot of variability. If you follow, this is just preliminary results of about 20-some 20, 20 herds uh, that already completed their program. In total, the, the, the project has about 50 uh, herds enrolled. Uh, so this is preliminary, but still, you can appreciate the variability in terms of uh, a lot of people is still some close do herd closures, some don't. Um, some, if you look here in the in the, in the next, next slide, some uh, uh, do whole herd exposure with live virus or vaccine and or a com combination of, of these. Uh, a lot of herds don't. They just sit back and relax in terms of relying na on natural exposure, not deliberate exposure. Same thing with guilts. Right, so lot of, still a lot of variability in, in uh, regards to how, pe how people are going back to their GDUs and uh, managing those guilds in response of, an, uh, of a PERS outbreak. So when we see that big variability, we see opportunities to keep focused and keep helping producers, vet clinics to understand how, how do those health uh, aspects help to, to predict kind of uh, productivity for, for the, the herd going forward and how to better recover from a, a PERS virus break. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share some of the results in terms of metrics, those preliminary results. The metrics we're gonna use are three. One is, the first one is uh, time to, what we're calling time to low prevalence, defined as how long th does it take for a herd to consistently produce PERS negative pigs by PCR. Uh, measured in terms of pro, uh, with processing fluids. Time to baseline productivity and total loss are measures of, uh, of, of, of impact, right? Productivity impact. And we're going to talk a little bit more when we get there. But before going to the results here of this cohort of herds that broke between 2020 and 2021, uh, we did a cohort some 10 years ago where we followed some 60 herds that broke with PERS virus and then compared some of these same metrics. And what we are seeing today, uh, if you look at the, the blue column, the, the contemporary cohort here of herds that broke uh, recently, it's taking almost 10 weeks more for them to achieve that consistent kind of low prevalence or, or, sh or winning negative pigs at winning, uh, winning PERS negative pigs compared to what we see, saw 10 years ago. Now you can argue today people are using processing fluids, family oral fluids that's way more sensitive than 10 years ago where people are still bleeding 20, 30, 16 some cases pigs per month, right? So can that, can, can, uh, can take that, but at the same time we do have evidence that the virus continues to evolve and it changed significantly uh, compared to 10 years ago when we'll compare the sequences of that time and today. And we're going to dig a little bit more in, in, into that. When you talk about time to baseline productivity, using exactly the same metrics, so the same methods to calculate uh, how long did it take for the farm to recover the same level of productivity measured as throughput number of pigs wind per week, uh, total pigs number uh, uh, Pig, pigs uh, wind per week, how long did it take for the farm? How many weeks did it take for the farm to reach that same level of productivity? So it's pretty much, long story short, using statistical process control, comparing to the same level of productivity of, the, uh, of each farm, right? So each farm, it's its own control, it's its own baseline, and we ask the question, how long did it take? And it also took longer also took longer, so that's, that has nothing to do with sensitivity of the methods, because again, it's the same method. So some evidence here that the herds that are breaking today, they are taking longer um, than the ones that we uh, compared uh, 10 years ago, that was 60, about 60 herds. Total loss per thousand sows is pretty similar to baseline productivity, but now it's a measure of severity. So now it's not time to recover anymore, is tell me how many pigs I did not win compared to what was expected right before the break. And what we are seeing today is about 4,000 pigs not wind throughout the course of the outbreak, and that's 50% higher number than what we observed 10 years ago. So 
In summary, this slide shows here, uh, and we are reporting both the median and the extremes, right? The 10th percent percentile all the way to the 90 percent percentile, and, and you can see that the whole distribution changed, not only the mean. And so about nine weeks more to achieve that PCR negative pig, circling pig, longer time to stability, longer time to baseline productivity, and a more severe, more severe losses per, per thousand cells here uh, compared to 10 years ago. So let's go a little bit on, uh, now on uh, the risk factors, going back to that survey that I showed that there is a lot of variation, and let's ask the question from, from these factors that we had in the survey, how does that relate to each of those metrics, right? So for time to low prevalence, and again, time to PCR negative peak consistently, let's look at the herd immunity related variables we're gonna, I'm gonna use this chart here, which is a survival uh, plot chart. It's, uh, don't get scared, it's, it's pretty straightforward, the analysis here. What you see in the y-axis or the vertical line is percentage of herds that achieved that's that uh, uh, time to low prevalence over time here uh, in weeks, right? So what you can see here is that the lines always start at zero, meaning at the beginning, right after the outbreak, there was no herd that achieved low prevalence because they are all acutely infected and, and producing PCR positive pigs. As time went by, then you start seeing some herds uh, going, uh, when the lines go up, that means the farms reach the, the metric, right? The low, time to low prevalence metric. So the quicker that line goes up, the better. And what you see here in this particular chart, we are comparing the time to low prevalence between herds that were naive at the time of the break compared to herds that were not naive at the time of the break, and pretty uh, uh, evidently shows here, as expected, because we saw that 10 years ago with the other cohort, that herds that are not naive, in other words, that have some prior herd immunity, they achieve PCR negative status sooner. So that's consistent, that's not, uh, s that was not surprising. So prior immunity, immunity matters. Um, now, if you start breaking that down, how long did the farm break? Was it within a year, one to three years, three, four f or years, or, fi or five years or more? And the, the lines, they align as, uh, as expected. Uh, and again, the farms that had a more recent break, they achieved time to low prevalence sooner than those farms that were naive, in other words, that didn't break in the previous five years, right? Also consistent. So again, prior immunity matters. When we go and ask about questions about exposure methods in the sow herd, not the guilds, we're gonna get in the guilds in a, in a bit, but uh, there were some herds, as I said, that did some deliberate exposure with either LVI or MLV, and herds that did not. In the red line, it showed herds that did uh, some whole herd exposure, and uh, those farms reached stability significantly sooner than those that just uh, uh, for lack of a better word, sit, sit and relax, right? And rely on natural uh, tr uh, uh, transmission and exposure to the, to the virus. So highlighting here the importance of whole, whole herd exposure so associated with better, quick, quicker uh, time to produce PCR negative pigs at weaning. So w w what else? If you start breaking that down, all right, I told you that whole herd exposure matters. Now the next question is, how about comparing MLV or live, any of those vaccine virus, attenuated vaccine viruses versus LVI, right? LVI, uh, live virus inoculation or the resident virus. In other words, some sort of feedback with the resident virus. And as we saw uh, 10 years ago, also consistent with what we saw before, L if you did LVI or a combination of LVI and vaccine virus, that uh, is, is associated with a quicker time to uh, low prevalence compared to herds that use vaccine virus only or herds that did uh, none of the above. So again, importance of whole herd exposure. If you break that down further, and uh, uh, the herds that did LVI first followed by MLV uh, were the ones that had the time to low prevalence sooner followed by M MLV first, followed by LVI, the same herd, and again, L MLV uh, alone, and then uh, n no exposure were the, the ones with a more delayed time to uh, stability or time to low prevalence. 
we didn't have a lot of farms that uh, had a, were operating in a batch farrowing system. There were four of those. Uh, most of those were operating in a continuous uh, f uh, 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 breed farrow system. And, but th those herds that were in a batch farrowing system, they achieved stability or low prevalence uh, significant sooner than those that were uh, in a continuous batch. So demonstrating some evidence here to support that all in all out in the farrowing room, and it makes biological sense, it's correlated with a faster uh, uh, elimination of the virus from the population, so it make, makes it harder for the virus to jump week after week, room after room. Looking at PERS virus, uh, uh, the, the virus itself, right, coming, remember we did some whole genome sequencing uh, from those herds, at least at least three whole genome sequences per, per, per herd, and uh, this was a little bit surprising for us, out of 20 herds that we got it's and submitted whole genome sequencing. Uh, guess how many of uh, how many herds that ha had a unique strain? Only two. The 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 other uh, 18 herds they had multiple strains circulating. Two, three, four, five. So h another evidence we 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 expected to see some of that, but not in that magnitude. Uh, one of the take homes here is when the farm is infected, it's infected with the virus. Yes kind of it's infected with a cloud of, of viruses that sometimes may be correlated, sometimes may, may not be. So uh, in, in any ways, the, uh, most herds had a, a multiple strains, and those that had three or more, they had a delayed time to stability compared to those that had only one or two strains. So more strains was associated here with longer time to low prevalence. If we look at the, at the virus, there's, there are different ways to do genotyping for PERS virus today, right? Uh, there is RFLP, there is lineage system, there, is, uh, there are other uh, methods to do that. But uh, l l long story short here, the, the take home is that regardless of the way you use to, to give that uh, license plate number to the virus, is um, there are some particular lineages that are associated with shorter and some lineages, in our case here in this study, lineage 1C, which is part of this big wave of virus going on right now, it's associated with a longer, uh, longer time to recover. In terms of baseline productivity, we're gonna go a little bit quicker because it's uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, associations that we saw with time to low prevalence, we, we also saw with time to baseline productivity. So looking at herd immunity related variables, the prior immunity, what we saw in terms of prior immu immunity for time to, to, to low prevalence was also true for productivity, for time to recover that productivity level. Right, so herds that were naive or close to provisional negative, stable, they uh, took longer to recover compared to, to those herds that were not. Same uh, trend here in terms of time between the, the break and the previous break. So immunity matters, we think, and the data supports. And so sa same thing here, uh, time to baseline productivity was shorter for herds that did some exposure compared to herds that did not do a deliberate exposure with either M MLV or LVI. And uh, also consistent with what we saw before, time to baseline productivity and the production impact uh, on the breeding herd goes in opposite the opposite side than what we observe in terms of time to produce negative pigs at weaning. Right, we just we just demonstrated that if you did LVI live virus exposure with or without vaccine, you produce PCR negative pigs sooner, and that's that's consistent. We've seen that since 2009 when we started uh, uh, comparing that metric, but now when you look at productivity, it's the other way around. Those herds that use vaccine virus, live vaccine virus, they achieve stability uh, by productivity. Uh, levels way, way sooner than those that uh, did uh, live virus inoculation, which will also make sense. It's an attenuated virus that is trying to replace the wild type in the, in the herd. In terms of uh, the, the virus itself, more, more of the same, so I'm gonna 
go quicker here. The the lineage one C variant was the the lineage that was associated with longer uh, or impact in productivity, and uh, there were some uh, uh, RFLPs or restricted restriction fragment length polymorphism type that were associated with uh, time to stability. Some were not. In this case, 144 was not, but 174 uh, was associated. Uh, herds that broke with 174 just took longer to recover productivity. And we know for a long time, since 2014, 15, that 174 is a, is a bad one. So one before, last year, before we start summarizing what we saw is uh, here, m more evidence that presence of more than one PERS virus strain, looking at the whole genome, not, not only, only that or five portion in a breeding herd is, is a reality, right? From those herds, we have 40 enrolled. From those 40, 20 already completed the first stage of the, product, the, the program, and from those 20, 18 had multiple strains um, going on. 18 had 18 strains. Only two had only one strain uh, go going on. And uh, there was a lot uh, uh, from those that had multiple strains going on. Um, there were all, all different combinations from uh, uh, v v uh, wild types with vaccine viruses, uh, strains. Uh, or recombination between those two, recombinations of wild type with wild type, recombination of vaccine with vaccine and, and or wild type with vaccines. And uh, so, so that's a reality, right? When we, so one of the take home series when we're uh, approaching diagnostics and try to characterize which virus am I dealing with, you gotta go beyond or five sequencing because that method, in any lab that you go is just a method, it's gonna spit out the consensus sequence. So if you have 10 sequences, you still get one number because that's one sequence because that's the consensus. And so with that, we kind of, you get what you ask for, right? If you ask for the consensus, you get the consensus. Now, if you ask for whole genome sequencing, uh, you get all the different viruses that are present in the, in the, in the, in the herds. And what we are seeing is more common than at least that we anticipated that you have multiple viruses circulating and those viruses are all of the above, recombinations between wild types and, and vaccines and, and so on and so forth. So two slides here to summarize some of those take home. So if you didn't get those survival plots, it's all right. Here is the summary for the, the take homes that we wanted to bring uh, to, the, to, to, uh, to the table here today. Compared to 10 years ago, the herds that we are following today they had a longer time to low prevalence, again, based on PCR of suckling pigs, nine weeks longer. Longer time to recover your baseline productivity, measured as number of pigs wind per thousand sows per week, and, and more severe losses, which makes sense, right? If it's taking longer to recover that productivity, you are having more severe losses uh, in the magnitude of about 1,300 pigs per thousand sows more. If you have a 5,000 sow farm, multiply that by five. So increased the, in terms of looking for the risk factors, right, increased time to low prevalence was uh, associated, could be, uh, uh, and we think it's a, a little bit of both, could be attributed to a more sensitive monitoring system that we have today, processing fluids, family oral fluids, and some other methods. But it, uh, but it can also be due to virus attributes, and we are seeing there is the evidence we didn't show here today, but in other studies show evidence of dramatic PERS evolution between 2009, 10, 11, and, and what we see today. Those are not the same viruses. So did they gain uh, ability to persist longer in the herd, to be, become high path, at least some strains? Uh, we, we believe so. And so the, how about the increased production impact? Is that based on the method? That's not based on the method because we, we're using the, exactly the same algorithm. So I would argue that it is real, that those herds that we follow today, they have uh, uh, more severe impact than we, what we observed 10 years ago. And uh, some, of, some of the, looking at the risk factors, the protective factors associated with uh, 
both time to low prevalence and the production impact were prior herd immunity that matters. That's why we see some, some herds investing in uh, building that herd immunity uh, uh, ahead, of, ahead of the break when that makes sense, right, for herds that are at risk or that have uh, a, a history of, of uh, inf outbreaks every two, three years. It makes sense for them to uh, build that herd immunity. Herd closure and exposure are protective factors associated with a, with, a, with, a, with a better recovery. Those herds that don't close the herd or close herds for a short period of time or that don't do deliberate exposure, those have uh, a, a more ugly break. Batch system, something that we should investigate further, but at least for health management, it makes a lot of sense. The difference here was, was dramatic in favor for batch systems, creating that all in, all out in the farrowing house. Viral properties, already talked a lot about that. So the genotype, number of strains, recombination, that all we, we gotta keep, keep learning uh, uh, to continuously investigate that in south farms. And, uh, and biomanagement practices, it's another thing that we, we, we believe that got to move the industry towards a better improving biomanagement practices in the farrowing house. And what I mean here specifically is that when we follow those herds uh, room after room or crate after crate, uh, after crate over time, we see that uh, there is evidence of, of virus uh, uh, transmission between crates, between rooms. So we, we, we got to make make it harder for virus to, to make those jumps. So whatever we can do from simple things like washing hands uh, and, and flow for, from uh, people working in the barn, that may uh, make a, a, a big difference here in terms of time, to, in, in terms of the consequences of PERS infection in a herd, right? All right, so with that, I uh, appreciate once more here the support from our group for uh, uh, the, this project and, uh, and the participants from the project. And I should have mentioned the sources of funds from this particular project came from uh, National Pork Board and NIPPA, so appreciate the, the support from, from there too. With that, Matt, I turn back to you. Thank you. We've got a little bit of time for uh, questions, so questions, questions for Dr. Linares. While you're seeing pre-herd exposure reducing the prevalence, and I'm talking about something from vaccines, is the vaccine also causing a problem? They started the vaccine years ago, the general prevalence, so the, the differences between 10 years ago and today in live Yeah, you 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 are correct that uh, between two, before 2009-10, the use of vaccine in breeding breeding herds was was very was close to none, right? Close. Yeah. And uh, our data from back then and today, they're in the same direction, supporting that if you use vaccine in the herd, in the breeding herd, it's associated with a longer time to ship those positive pigs out, uh, the negative pigs out, right? So. It is associated with that delayed time to stability or low prevalence, whatever you want to call it. But also, having said that, it is also so, uh, uh, associated here consistently, so with uh, lower productivity impact. So depending on on what you want, right? You gotta have those two factors in in your equation, depending on what your outcome metric of interest is. Yeah, so that's a good question. I don't have that data from 10 years ago. At that time, all we used, at least to my knowledge, was R5. And now we're starting to use whole genome just because the cost is going down, right? Uh, two is three, four hundred dollars per, per test. Still not as widespread as R5, which costs about hundred dollars. So it's a good question. It'll be 
happy to, you know, if we had access to the, uh, a serum bank from 10 years ago, and we may have some of that to go back and and understand was that same genetic variability we're seeing today where we're seeing back then? I don't know that, but. Yeah, yeah, it's a good, it's a good thought. If if you if you know, and I can do some digging too, too. If uh, if there is availability of some serum banks that we could go back ten years ago and and, and check, somebody uh, like a you know USDA maybe, yeah. maybe names they 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 may have some of that no, data. Any further questions for Dr. Linares? If not, uh, we will have a short break and then meet back in uh, Benton Auditorium for this afternoon's panel. But uh, before that, let's go ahead and put our hands together on a really good pre uh, presentation from Daniel. Thank you.